Hello, welcome back to Math 155. Today, we're going to be continuing our discussion of food webs and also introducing the idea of compartment models. In fact, we've already met compartment models earlier in this course, um, but we haven't discussed them in terms of graphs and how we can represent them using some of the um, discrete mathematics tools that we've learned in the last couple of lectures. Okay, so we're going to introduce some new terminology as well, unique predator dominant species and trophic status dominant species. This are, these are just extensions of some of the um, ideas of, of trophic level that we've um, discussed in the last lecture uh, before going on to ideas of competition graphs and compartment models. Okay, let's start by thinking about dominant species in a food web. And there's various different definitions, just as we had defini different definitions for trophic level. Um, to different ways in which we can classify dominant species in a food web. One of these is unique predator dominant species. And we say that a species is dominant in a food web if it has a prey for which it is the only predator. Okay, so here we have a food web. And the first step that we need to do is we need to identify all the species that have out degree one. So find all species with out degree one. Why is that the case? Well, our unique predator dominant species um, is classified in that way if it is the only predator for a particular species. So that means that if a species has out degree two, then it has two predators. So let's first of all identify all the species that have out degree one. So A has out degree one, so does E and F, I, J, M, and N, K, and L. So note, for example, G does not have out degree one, it has out degree two, so um, this uh, G cannot be Note, for example, that uh, G has out degree two, so it cannot be, uh, its, its predators cannot be classified as unique predator dominant species. So I found all the species with out degree one. Now I need to look at what eats those species. So the species A, it's eaten by species D. A is actually a primary producer, so we're not going to classify um, D as a uh, unique predator dominant species because it's actually going to be a herbivore. There's also this complication here that it, that it eats itself. So um, we're not going to classify D as a unique predator dominant species because it eats a primary producer. Um, let's see, for species F, this is eaten by species E. That's fine. So E is a unique predator dominant species. Uh, let's work our way through all of the other pink vertices. I'm going to cross off the ones that are not relevant. Okay, so species I gets eaten by species M. So this is a unique predator dominant species, species M. Uh, species J eats species E. So it's one up from that. So this is also unique predator dominant, as is N because it eats J. O is unique predator dominant because it's the only predator of M. It's also the only predator of N. We see that M is also the only predator of K, but we've already counted M because it is also the only predator of I. And O is the only predator of L as well, so we don't count L either. So here, our unique predator dominant species, so we find the predators. Um, coming out from those species one. That's the method that we use. So in our case here, our unique predator dominant species are going to be E, J, M, N, and O. Okay. The other definition that we're going to look at for dominant species is something called trophic status dominant species. And here we say that a species is dominant if its trophic status, which we calculated last time, uh, its trophic status is greater 
and the number of species in the food web above level zero. So remember, level zero is going to be our primary producers. In this case, this is A, B, and C. They have trophic status zero, so the trophic statuses are just indicated here next to each of these species. So we want to count all the other species in the food web that don't have trophic status zero. Alternatively, you can count every state, every species in the food web and then subtract the number that have um, trophic status zero. So subtract all the primary producers. So here, how many do we have in this food web? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So there are 12 species in this food web that have trophic status above level zero. So let's just make a note of that. So we have 12 species above level zero. And then we want to find all the species that have trophic status greater than this number. So we need the trophic status to be greater than 12. So which species satisfy that? Well, let's work our way down from the top. O here has trophic status 33, which is greater than 12. So we can say O has 33 greater than 12. So this is a trophic status dominant species. What else do we have? Let's work our way down the food web. The reason we work down the food web is just because um, we're starting from the largest numbers. So we might as well do that. So here we've got N has trophic status 14, which is also greater than 12. And then if we look through, the next highest number is nine here, but nine is less than 12. So N can't be trophic status dominant. J also has trophic status nine, which is less than 12. So our only trophic status dominant species, which I've just abbreviated there, are species O and N. Okay, let's think about another way of looking at these food webs. Um, on the left-hand side here, we've got a food web that we've seen before. On the right-hand side, we've got another representation of some of the information that we have on the left-hand side. This is called on the right-hand side a competition graph. And a competition graph is related to this food web, but rather than showing which species each, each which other species in a directed graph, here we're going to have an undirected graph, which just shows competition between species. And so competition means competition for food in this context. Okay. So what we do is we draw out all the nodes and they don't have to be um, written in the same format. Sometimes it can help to do that. Sometimes you just want to uh, put them all down in a list like they are here. And we want to draw a link between any two species that share a food source. So kelp doesn't have any food sources, so it appears disconnected here. Small fishes and sea urchins, well, they both share a food source. So another way of looking at it is finding all the all the uh, species that have out degree two or more, and then looking at what they connect to. So in this case, kelp is eaten by both small fishes and sea urchins. So small fishes and sea urchins compete for kelp. So because they compete, we draw a link between them in this competition graph. Let's carry on working our way up. We see that uh, there is no other case where a species has out degree two. So small fishes have out degree one, so they only have one predator, which is large crabs. Sea urchins have out degree one, their only predator is sea otters. Likewise, large crabs, their only predator is sea otters. And sea otters, their only predator is sharks. So there's no other competition going on here. A mistake that people often make is that they see there are two arrows going into sea otters, and so they end up drawing a, a line between sea urchins and large crabs. But sea urchins and large crabs are not competing with each other for food. Okay, so this competition graph in this, in this particular context is only describing competition between uh, species for food itself. Okay, so sea urchins and smallish fishes are connected in the competition graph because they both compete for kelp. Okay, so that's the uh, last uh, 
a um, little bit of this course that's about food webs, we're now going to be thinking about graphs in the context of compartment models. And we've already met compartment models. Um, we talked about this earlier in the, in the course when we say had a population that was age structured, say juveniles going into adults and adults also producing juveniles. We didn't represent these in graph format, but we can do, and that can help to understand the, the flow um, of individuals through these populations. Um, we saw on the opening page, there was an example of a disease model. So for example, you could have flow from individuals who are susceptible to infected to recovered. That's another example of a compartment model. Here on this slide, we have something called pharmacokinetics. So that's describing um, uh, how drugs um, move through the body. So here we've got a one compartment model on the left-hand side where the drugs are absorbed. They go through some central compartments, say an organ, and then they're eliminated. On the right-hand side, maybe they have a central component, but then they're also distributed to another part of the body. So maybe they initially come into the stomach and then they end up going into the liver or some other um, part of the body. So we can think of the flow of whether it's drugs or individuals in a population into different compartments that we might want to define. So like I said, we've already met this earlier in the course when we looked at some of our first population models. So when we had our discrete population models, if you recall, we had these Leslie matrices. And these Leslie matrices told us from one year to the next or one generation to the next, how uh, individuals moved between classes. And really what this, this Leslie matrix is saying is what is the contribution from one class to the next? Okay, so when we multiplied these out, suppose we had a vector here of our cubs, our adult bears and our elderly bears. If we called this our vector X in year N, to work out the population in year N plus one, we take this Leslie matrix and multiply it by the population in year N. Okay, so this first column and first row represent cubs, second column and row adults, third column and row elderly bears. So we can take a Leslie matrix and we can convert that into the graph that we see on the left-hand side here. So this is a directed graph and it's a directed graph because this flow from one class or one compartment into another. And we can take these numbers in our Leslie matrix to turn it into a weighted directed graph that shows how much each class or compartment is contributing to the compartment in the next year. So, for example, if we think about the contribution of cubs to cubs, from adults to adults, and from elderly bears to elderly bears, we have these three numbers here. What that's really saying is, if we think of these three vertices, cubs, adults, and elderly bears, we have 17 over 30 is the, the contribution from cubs in one year to the next, okay? So... This is the contribution here to here. This is my 17 over 30. So this is coming from the first entry of my Leslie matrix. The second row, second column, we have 17 over 20. That's our contribution of adults to adults. And from elderly to elderly, third row, third column, we have three quarters. So the flow from here to here is three quarters. Okay, all of these, uh, these numbers here, they come from these word descriptions. If you recall, we converted those into our Leslie matrix, and we're now just converting those into graph form. Okay, let's think about some other entries. I'm going to change color just to help make this a little bit clearer. Let's think about the first row. So these are the uh, contributions from each of the categories to cubs in the next year. So this 2.1 here, is adult bears producing on average 2.1 cubs per year. So this is telling me what is the flow from adults to cubs. It's 2.1. So adults are producing 2.1 cubs per year on average. We also have births from these elderly bears. And here we have this 0.6. So we can add those, those uh, arrows and, and weights to this graph. Let's think about the second row switch color again. So here we have cubs 
sorry, we have, yeah, cubs going into adults. So this is aging. So cubs going into adults. It's this arrow here. We have no cubs going into elderly bears, so nothing here. We also have no um, elderly bears going into adults. So there's no E to A, and likewise, there's no C to E. Okay, let's do our final row here. So we've already said we don't have anything here. We do have um, adults aging into elderly bears. So we have an arrow going here. And we're told that a tenth of our adults mature to become elderly. We don't have arrows coming out for the, uh, the bears that are dying. So we notice we have these, these facts about bears that are dying. This is taken into account um, in our Leslie matrix by things that neither stay in the same age category nor age. Okay. So here we've been able to convert the, the information in my Leslie matrix into the graph, but we can also go in the other direction. So if we have this graph here, we can convert it into a Leslie matrix by following uh, or, or reversing the same process that I've just talked about. So I know for example, if I wanted to translate this information in the graph into a Leslie matrix, I can think about, first of all, what is in this C going into C? Well, it's 17 over 30. What's A going into A? It's 17 over 20. What's E going into E? It's 3 over 4, and so on. So we can convert back and forth between this, uh, this graph format and the um, Leslie matrix uh, and that can help us to, to better understand the flow between these different compartments. So that was just uh, one example. We can do this more generally if we have a general Leslie matrix or a general graph here. So this is a general Leslie matrix with K different compartments. And here we've got a, the corresponding graph. We can see that on this main diagonal, this is what's flowing from that class into that class. So things that survive and don't age, essentially, if this is a if this is an age structure population, we have flow from class, um, from this class here into the second class here. So if we have a i j, this is telling me what is the flow from class J, so from compartment J into compartment I. Okay, so if I take an example here, this 2, 1 is an arrow going from compartment 1 into compartment 2. That's this arrow here. So A, I, J, we're going from compartment we have two one here, so A two one. We're going from compartment one into compartment two. So this is A two one. This would be the entry that goes on the second row here, A two one. The second row, first column, that's telling me the flow from compartment one into compartment two. So we can do this uh, with whatever Leslie matrix we have or, or whatever um, directed graph that, that could form a Leslie matrix, we can go back and forth between these things um, to construct graphs or to construct Leslie matrices. Okay, that's it for today. I'll see you at the problem class.